I'm Gary, and this is Coasting with Culture. I like to combine theme park visits and riding roller coasters with various cultural experiences around the world. 2020 was a very challenging year to travel, and while I managed to get in a visit to South America before the pandemic really got going, the rest of the year was mainly short visits and day trips. As the new year begins, I decided to kick 2021 off with a quick overnight trip to New Jersey for a chance to get a shameless coaster credit, visit the memorial and historic site of a great inventor, and to visit one of the newest indoor theme parks that has the world's steepest roller coaster. As the end of 2020 came closer, and with some things still to be determined in my personal life, I had not really made any plans for 2021 yet, as I await to see how things fall into place. But the combination of a special promotion with an already low fare, and a schedule that allowed this quick adventure to fit in a weekend off from work made it an easy choice to get the new year started on the right foot. As is common for me living in the Seattle area, it was another journey with trusty old Alaska Airlines. And thanks to their extending the 2020 frequent flyer statuses through 2021, I lucked out with a first class upgrade for the flight to Newark. Thanks to the usual Seattle winter weather, there wouldn't be a chance to enjoy the view of the Cascades on takeoff, but that would be made up for a bit later in the flight. While the clouds did linger for a while, they would open up a bit further west, giving the opportunity to enjoy the view of the snow-covered Rockies. Later into the flight we made our way over the plains and the clouds opened up in a few locations to see the likes of Lake Huron as well as a bit of Canada along Lake Erie. Unfortunately, I was on the wrong side of the plane to try and see Cedar Point. As our descent began, we were over Pennsylvania and managed to see a bit of the state's mountains along with being able to spot the popular Pocono Raceway, the racetrack known for its unique triangular shape. Getting closer to landing gave passengers on this side of the aircraft a view of New York City in the distance. Welcome to Newark. The local time is 4.11. Please note the time change. Once again, thanks for choosing us. We look forward to uh, seeing you soon and thank you for masking up. It's kind of fitting that I find a picture of this guy here, Thomas Edison, one of the greatest inventors ever, because I discovered that where I'm staying tonight on the way to 
visiting Nickelodeon Universe, the town of Edison was named after this guy because that's where he created a lot of his inventions. This trip would be more connected to the famous inventor, but first, it was time to get the rental car for a quick drive to the first coaster stop of 2021. In the town of Freehold, there's a family entertainment center called I Play America. This is one of the FECs that really emphasizes the appearance inside, as it gives the feel of a true theme park. Especially with the areas that are meant to feel like a boardwalk on the Jersey Shore. They also feature a large arcade, a staple of many FECs in operation. But what brought me here was the chance to get the first new coaster credit of 2021, the Freedom Rider. Another SBF Visa spinner like many ridden before, but out of all of those found in FECs, this may have been one of the best themed, as it was surrounded by various parts as if it was inside a working garage. It's neat when places like this add a bit of theming to their attractions. It felt fitting that the first new coaster of the year was another shameless coaster credit, but there would be more the next day. After staying in the Edison, New Brunswick area of New Jersey for the night, I made a short drive to the area of Menlo Park, which was the former home of the famous American inventor, Thomas Edison. So without realizing it, I had no idea that the town of Edison, New Jersey was named after this guy, the famous inventor who has shaped a lot of industry in not only the country, but around the world as well. Looking at all the things that he was responsible for the creation of. And it turns out this area is where he built one of his first laboratories to create somewhere in the range of 400 different inventions. When visiting the Thomas Edison Center at Menlo Park, there are several things to see. Within a block of the highway is the sign that indicates where Edison's home once stood. This sign shares information about that house and the land that it used to stand on, which is now filled with trees in a small trail. Along with some interesting information about what else has been discovered here. They even mentioned on the plaque out front that there was a point where they did an archaeological search of this particular ground and they found items that belonged to Native Americans that lived in this area. Plus they found a couple of odd items that may have possibly belonged to the Edison family. Things from buttons and loose materials of building to ceramics and things that might have been part of his inventing process. Continuing further up Christie Street brings you to the location of the Sarah Jordan Boarding House. Sarah was the half-sister of Thomas's wife, Mary. What's really cool is if you look carefully enough, you can see the brick in the ground and that indicates the line where the foundation of the Dean House for the Edison Homestead Complex was set up. This complex would eventually become part of a residential area, but for a while, Edison used it for his employees as a place to stay when they work in his laboratory. A little bit further down the street is a small tribute to one of the inventions Edison was best known for, the incandescent light bulb, which was just one of many inventions created in this complex. Across the street from this bulb is the main part of the Edison Center at Menlo Park. This area is both a memorial and historic site, as this was where his laboratory was located and where much of his and his staff's work was done. On the corner is a spot where his office was located where he met with politicians, business leaders, and the media, with its placement outlined much like the previous boarding house. On the opposite corner is a small museum that contains artifacts from Edison, including a few of his inventions that guides will demonstrate how they work.
The most prominent feature of this complex is the Memorial Tower, which not only pays homage to the famous inventor and his contributions, but also stands on the site of his laboratory where much of his work was conducted. The tower is accessible as part of the tour offered at the complex. And on it are the plaques that describe the career and achievements of Edison. The top of the tower may look familiar because of its resemblance to the incandescent light bulb that he invented. But again, that was only one of the many things he was responsible for the creation of on these grounds. And that's kind of incredible to think about all the inventions that that guy has done in his career that have made some of the things that we enjoy on an everyday basis possible. He was responsible for helping with the first recording of sound, which, you know, obviously for making this video wouldn't have been possible had that not been done. He also helped with the creation of the ability to record motion picture. And so without either of those two things, this video would look a lot like this. He also helped with the creation of the incandescent light bulb, which has now modernized into the various forms of light bulbs that we see today that can be enjoyed at some of the different amusement parks that I've visited and others have visited. The creation of electric trains, which has made it a lot easier for us to get around. And you see these things all over the world and here in the US. It's incredible to think about how much this man has influenced our lives on a daily basis. And so it's really cool to get a chance to come and see the site of his laboratory, his home, where he made a lot of these inventions that influence our everyday lives. Now that there's been an opportunity to check out the home and laboratory location of Thomas Edison, it's time to get back in the car and warm up because it's really cold out here right now and start heading up north. Because up north there is an amusement park that is open in the wintertime and that is going to be none other than Nickelodeon Universe. Located in East Rutherford, as part of the larger Meadowlands complex, is the American Dream. No, not the concept many use as motivation for life, rather a massive indoor shopping complex owned by the group that runs the Mall of America in Minnesota and the West Edmonton Mall in Alberta. Much like those malls, this is one that offers a variety of entertainment beyond shopping, such as the indoor ski center, Big Snow, which is open year round and gives urban residents a chance to hit the slopes closer to home. There are also decorative plazas that make for some great photo opportunities or a relaxing spot to sit for a break. Another plaza contains an ice rink, which can host general skating sessions as well as some games of hockey under the large windows above to allow sunlight in. One of the major attractions at American Dream is the DreamWorks themed indoor water park. Inspired by some of the most popular animation franchises and featuring some complex slide towers that surround the main wave pool in the middle. This might be one to check out on a future visit if possible. While the mall offers a wide variety of things to see and do, one of the more obvious things you'll notice about it is the amount of unoccupied space. While the pandemic certainly hasn't helped as it's affected a wide variety of businesses in the country and around the world, many of those who visited the complex when Nickelodeon Universe first opened shared that this was common back then as the retail business continues to be in flux due to the prevalence of online shopping. There are sections of the mall that felt more complete with a larger number of stores open, but there were also a lot of walls that seemed to be in places where stores would have been. The ice rink especially stands out as you currently can't access the upper deck surrounding it because of the lack of retailers at this time. While this is a bit of a bleak appearance for the mall, there's always the possibility that it'll work its way through recovery and could potentially become the destination it was intended to. 
One reason that I'm pulling for it to succeed is so that others can enjoy one of the highlights of the complex and the motivation for today's visit, Nickelodeon Universe. This indoor theme park is one of the newest theme parks in the United States, having opened in the fall of 2019. So I don't always travel with a friend or with other people. I do have a bit of experience in going solo. However, this time, I do have a friend joining me here at Nickelodeon Universe. Nicole! You've made it! So Nicole came over from Pennsylvania to join for this visit to Nickelodeon Universe since it's only a short drive away for her. You may remember seeing her in last year's, or I guess now it's Two years ago, Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Texas with Wes as we went to Six Flags over Texas, Six Flags Fiesta, Texas, getting to, um, uh, what was the place in Arkansas? Magic, Magic Springs. Springs. <laughs> yeah, there we go, Magic Springs. And then also she was along with the ride to Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho. So I think it's about time we go ahead and see what we've got here at Nickelodeon Universe. What do you think? Yes. Yeah, let's do yes. it. Let's go. Much like its counterpart at the Mall of America in Minnesota, this park's theme is inspired by the characters of different shows from Nickelodeon, such as SpongeBob SquarePants. While they use many of the same characters as the Minnesota version, their respective ride selections are more unique to each other, and similar rides have different themes, much in the same fashion as Six Flags has done with some of their cloned rides. This park is even continuing to add more rides, as seen with the prep work for what appear to be a sort of whip ride and a small swing ride. But Nicole and I weren't here for the smaller rides yet to be installed. We were here for their coasters that were already operating, and this park shines in that department. We kicked our riding off with the biggest coaster in the park, TMNT Shell Razor. This Gerslauer Eurofighter is a near clone of Takabisha from Fuji Q in Japan, as its steepest drop is ever so slightly more than the Japanese version to make it the world's steepest roller coaster at 121.5 degrees. Unlike most coasters though, its largest drop isn't the beginning. Rather, this coaster kicks off with a short drop turning out of the station and into a low barrel roll before hitting a set of brakes that will eventually lead to the ride's launch, taking you into the first few inversions. The size of this coaster dwarfs everything at the Minnesota Park and all but one ride here in New Jersey that we'll see later. One downside of this coaster is that it has a bit of a rattle but it's certainly worth a ride for the experience of the drop and the view right before. After hitting the brakes in the middle, it climbs up the tallest lift hill for that steepest drop in the world. It doesn't get to that drop right away, however, as the ceiling was built so that the car could be stopped at the top and give you a chance to see out the windows for a view of New York City on the other side of the river, and it gives you a good amount of time to see it. I was almost convinced that the ride was having mechanical issues while we were up there. But it was part of the experience before you went through that incredible drop, leading into the second half of the ride. The second coaster of the day was Timmy's Half Pipe Havoc, an Intamin surf rider that is a clone of the Avatar Airbender at Minnesota's Nick Universe. This one does feature a different style lap bar and can be a bit tricky to get into. The seats are meant to spin while the car travels back and forth, but the weight balance on our side led to a lack of spinning for us, so it was more of a rocking sensation for our turn. One of the park's most intriguing coasters is Sandy's Blasting Bronco, an Intamin launching coaster which is very similar to the Premier Ride Skyrocket 2 that involves launching forwards and backwards to gain momentum and then forwards again to go through the course. But it differentiates itself from the Premier Rides version by rotating and doing the same course with the train backwards. 
while this was a coaster I was really looking forward to trying out, it unfortunately was down for the day. There was a post from the Coaster Kings about it before where they had mentioned that it had been closed since Sunday and unfortunately it does appear that it is continuing to stay closed at this point. It's making some occasional hissing noises so it sounds like there's power to it but nobody actually working on the ride so unfortunately this one's gonna have to wait until next time. The most family-friendly coaster in the park is the Nickelodeon Slime Streak. This custom Chance Rides designed coaster feels inspired by the Pepsi Orange Streak found at the other Nickelodeon universe as it rides over a large portion of the park while circling around several other rides. It isn't quite as long as the Minnesota ride, but it does offer a larger first drop and higher speeds through the course, giving a bit more of a thrill than your typical family coaster. The last coaster that we had to ride on our visit was Shredder, a custom Gerslauer spinning coaster that is heavily intertwined with the Shell Razor as it winds above, below, and around the largest coaster in the park. But this ride is no slouch. This is the largest spinning coaster to come from Gerslauer, with its length being nearly 800 feet longer than any other, and you can tell it's a longer ride from the amount of time you're on board from beginning to end. If you have an unbalanced car as Nicole and I had, this thing will spin like crazy. Unfortunately, it didn't go so well for Nicole as the spinning was a bit too extreme for her. But if you love a good spin on a coaster like this as I typically do, this is an excellent ride for it. As Nicole needed a break from the crazy spinning, we enjoyed a milder ride on the Rugrats Reptar themed carousel. The final ride of the day would come in the form of the Skyline Scream, a unique version of the SNS Compressed Air Tower Rides, as it's one of the few that features rotating seats, as it gives you a chance to enjoy the view of the surrounding area, especially nearby New York City, before it has its drop back towards the ground. Compared to other SNS Tower Rides, this one's a bit milder, but the view above certainly makes it worthwhile and makes up part of a great collection of rides in the park. So Nicole and I just finished up at Nickelodeon Universe. It's a really neat park. One of the things that we kind of noticed about it was it's a little bit smaller than what might have been anticipated with the uh, use of compacting everything together, having rides ride on top of each other, like the Shredder on top of the Shell Razor. But there was some good rides. Nicole, what do you think was the highlight of the park? I think Shell Razor was the highlight of the park. Shell Razor was pretty awesome, especially that view of the skyline of New York. The SNS Tower does the same thing, gives a fantastic view of the city of New York just across the river there. There was one thing that was a bit of a bummer, though, of course, being that Sandy wasn't operating. It was down as I kind of anticipated based off of the post from the other day. So, But we still got four of the five coasters. That's gonna be a nice way to kick off 2021 and hopefully this will continue to be a better year than 2020 has been for many folks. With that being said though, unfortunately, I've got a flight to catch, so I gotta head over to Newark Airport, but Nicole, it was nice to catch yes, up again. It was great seeing you too. The unfortunate side of quick trips like this is that it ends before you know it, but I enjoyed that I could still visit two new locations for coasters and a historic site in a quick trip without having to miss any work days. As the tram approached the terminal, the plane I would be flying home on had just arrived from its morning to afternoon flight from Seattle. It would just be a matter of cleaning and reloading before returning home to the Pacific Northwest.
This evening flight made for a lovely sunset view as we chased the sun to the west until we were flying in the nighttime sky. It's always fun to fly back into Seattle when the weather is clearer or the clouds are higher as you can more easily see landmarks like the floating bridges on Lake Washington and in my case, find the general area of where my home is. With another Alaska Airlines flight under my belt, I was back in Seattle and ready to head home. As 2021 continues, I don't know when I'll be back here to start my next adventure. In some respects though, I can't help but think that this year is going to be better than the last. And I certainly hope that comes true for many of us. I may not know where I'll go next, or even when it'll happen, but getting home at a decent hour seems like a great excuse to start looking into some potential places to go coasting with culture when that time comes. Thank you for watching this Coasting with Culture video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and click the subscribe button below to see future videos here on YouTube like these ones which you may enjoy as well. Additional content can be found at coastingwithculture.com and you can also follow Coasting with Culture on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for announcements, previews, and updates. Thanks again for watching and until next time, take care and safe travels.